Mark chapter 14, while you're turning, uh, Julian is, is the gentleman that God uses to uh, supply the bread to us from local vendors. He goes early Sunday morning before your alarm clock goes off. He's already around and picking things up. And out in the lobby this morning, you'll notice the table on the, or the bread out there on the table. Uh, take that. That bread is for us to use as we uh, find folks in our community that might have a need for food. And at the same time, it's an opportunity for us to be able to use that as a tool to open a conversation about the gospel. Giving a loaf of bread, uh, some kind of pastry, something along those lines, and it opens a conversation about the bread of life. He also told me, and then Dana also uh, caught me this morning, uh, Dana Eller, and they're both heavily involved in Mark Elfrard with the prison ministry. And that is something that with COVID had closed down for a long time. Uh, my understanding is not only is it reopen, but uh, there is a desperate need for help. Uh, I heard all kinds of numbers this morning of folks that had, had shown up last Thursday night. We go in once a week uh, as the time that's been allotted to uh, the group from our church family that goes and serves in the prison ministry. Uh, we need some men. They're going over to uh, Joseph uh, Conte Prison right now and uh, right here in Pompano. And on Thursday nights, if you're available and you would like to go, they desperately need some help. Uh, whereas before it was a small number, before COVID, after, my understanding was it was twice as many people showed up last week and uh, just kind of overwhelming, can, can use some additional help. We have um, two teams, they'll rotate every other Thursday, go in and lead a Bible study there for those and, and seen some great things take place. So if you're interested in that, you can see uh, uh, Julian, you can see Dana Eller, you can uh, find Mark Elfrard, or you can put it on one of those yellow cards at the end of the service and they'll get the information to you. There's a training you go through, and uh, they can desperately use some help on that, but great opportunity. So as Julian mentioned a moment ago, it's Palm Sunday. Pastor Robert alluded to that. We've been preaching through just a little bit ahead of schedule, kind of working our way through that. And so we've already kind of talked about that road into Jerusalem, that day where Jesus rode in on the donkey. Again, a symbol of peace. When a king rode a horse, it was a symbol of what? War. When a king rode a donkey, it was a symbol of peace. So we have the Prince of Peace riding into Jerusalem. We have the people that are coming out. They're waving the, the palm branches, eventually called hosannas, symbols of victory. They were laying their coats across the, the road. Uh, the way you welcome a king, and as he's coming in, they're thinking that he is the king that's going to overthrow the Roman government and establish his kingdom. That was the idea. They what they thought and what was happening were two different things. They missed the point. Even Jesus had spoken about it and talked about it, but they still missed it. The same people that welcomed him on Palm Sunday were the same people that said, crucify him a week later. He didn't give them what they wanted. Modern day Christianity oftentimes views God as somewhat of a cosmic vending machine. I love Jesus, drop my quarter in, push the button. He gives me what I want. He didn't give me what I want. I quit. I'm out of here. God's not faithful. He let me down. I can't believe this happened. How could he do this to me? He owes us nothing. Sometimes we forget that. And those people had that view. Hey, on, on, on Palm Sunday, they thought he was doing everything they wanted him to do. And as the week went on, they realized, I'm not getting what I want out of this thing. Crucify him. The whole attitude changed. We continued on our journey. Last week, we went into the upper room. This morning, we'll pick up right there. I want us to review just a moment. We see the story in Matthew. We see it in Mark. We see it in Luke. We see it uh, again over in 1 Corinthians, the story of the uh, Last Supper, as it's called. It didn't look like Leonardo's uh, picture there. It looked a whole lot different. It wasn't seated around a fancy table. It was leaning, as the Eastern culture was, on one arm, eating with the other. It wasn't a loaf of bread. It was flat bread. It was matzah. It snapped same type bread that the Jewish people use today. We're going to pick up with this story at this point. It's taking place. I want to give you the timeline this morning as we kind of just stop and think, how did all this happen? So here we are Thursday between about 6 and 9 p.m. Jesus told the disciples how they were going to go in and where this room was to be prepared and, and how they would find it. And they get up there and they start to put it all together. I mentioned the way that it's shared in each of the Gospels. It's what we call the harmony of the Gospels. It's not that they disagree with one another. It's that one might include something that the other one doesn't, or this one includes a little bit that that one doesn't. And 
Even around the table, we see as, as they were dining, we saw when Jesus uh, was being anointed, one disciple from his vantage point could see the woman anointing Jesus' feet, and another could see Jesus' head. And, and so as we're seeing this, we see oftentimes it's like an accident out here on the corner. If something were to happen and somebody viewed it from 3rd Avenue and somebody viewed it from 48th Street and they, they looked, they would have different perspectives because of their position. And that's all that's happening here with the, the, the uh, Gospels. Same story. It's not different. It doesn't contradict. It's just you take them all and put them together and you get all the facts and as we look at this story, we see that there in the Last Supper was held at a house there in Jerusalem. And uh, those of you that went with us, again, we talked about, we were there. We stood in one of those rooms. It was just like that room, if not the room where Jesus and his disciples met. And I mentioned last week, kind of in passing and very quickly, that there had been a group of people that said, hey, we're ready to go back. And Israel is reopened. And I, I'm ready. So when, you, when you're ready, you put it on that yellow card this morning. You want to go with us. We'll see if we can set something up toward the end of this year. One of the best times to travel is October and November, right after some of their feasts. You go over, and it's just amazing. Uh, the first time I came back from Israel, I had this, this opinion. A pastor ought never step in the pulpit until he's been. Because what we teach and what we see once you've been over there is sometimes very, very different. We oftentimes take a, a book that was written toward Eastern culture and we westernize it. We teach it based on what we understand rather than understanding the traditions and the cultures and the customs of the day. And it changes some of those things when we really understand it. Well, Jesus was in that room and he begins to wash the disciples' feet. And We talked last week about the bathing and P Peter said, hey, don't wash me, Lord. And he said, Peter, you're clean. The idea of bathing the greek word that says you've already been fully washed the picture of salvation peter you don't need to have everything washed but your feet you do you go through life and you travel and as we go day by day we're involved in the dirtiness the sin of the world and we need to have our feet cleaned as the symbolism and we don't need to be saved again but we need to be in right relationship with christ and have our sin forgiven first john 1 9 if we confess our sin he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, the disciples, even after all of this, they argue over who's going to be the greatest in Luke chapter 22. They kind of miss some of that. He's giving them the power of the towel, the picture here, the, the washing of the feet, the serving one another. And they go, oh, who's going to be the greatest? They missed part of the message again. Then Jesus goes on, and I'm going through this quickly because we talked about them last week. Jesus predicts Peter's denial. Peter said, oh, no, Lord, I'd never do that. And he says, hey, by the time the cock crows, yeah, you will. And uh, we showed you that uh, roosters were dirty animals not even allowed in Jerusalem and how that regardless whether you believe it was the male chicken or you believe it was the timing, the watch, the signal of the watch. And three times you'll see as we go through this in the timeline today how that that would have happened. And on that third watch, that's exactly when Peter had denied him. We see Jesus breaking bread. We see Jesus consuming the fruit of the vine, the picture of his blood that was going to be shed. In Luke chapter 22, let me read it to you just briefly here, verses 19 and 20. He took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. We'll observe communion on Friday night. When we come together at 6 o'clock, it'll be somewhat of a somber service. It's going to be a remembrance of the cross. It's going to be a remembrance of the crucifixion. As that's what Good Friday is about. We've asked our folks, even on our campus, let's remember what the day is about. Let's remember what Good Friday really is. It's not just a day off work. It's not a day to stay home or when school's out and just to kind of hang out. And, no, it's, a, it's the day we remember the crucifixion of Christ. That's what this is about. And as we gather on Friday night, we sing, and as we read Scripture, and as we observe communion, it'll be a brief service, and it'll be a family service, but it'll be a time where we walk out remembering the crucifixion of Christ. We pick up point number two, if you're following along, Jesus walking out toward the Mount of Olives. It says after that they had finished the supper, then uh, they sang a hymn, and they walked out into the garden. By now, we're at about 10 p.m. on Thursday. Mark chapter 14, verse 26 is where we read it. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. 
Jesus and his disciples, they leave this house. They go across the Kidron Valley, also known as the uh, Valley of Jehoshaphat, to Gethsemane. It's just east of Jerusalem. I think we have a picture of it here. As you look up on the screen, those of you that have been to Jerusalem, you'll see the Temple Mount on the left. You see the construction kind of on the, the top of there, top left. And then as you look on the far right, you'll see that's the Mount of Olives. And that valley in between is the Kidron Valley. Now, it's not a big valley. It doesn't take a long time to get there. When they talk about crossing a valley, it's not days worth of travel. We're, we're talking a very short amount of time. But Jesus leaving the upper room with his disciples, they go out, they cross the Kidron Valley. And if you look, I'd say about center screen up toward the top, you'll see a, a grove of the olive trees. Garden of Gethsemane, you can just picture that being covered in olive trees years ago. And yet that one section remains. And Picture that as the place where Jesus literally left that room, walked across that valley and up that hill to the Mount of Olives, ultimately to come back, and we'll look at that in just a little while. All of that taking place, about 10 o'clock, they leave the room and they walk across that valley. Again, it's not, it's not a long walk. It's not, when we, when we think about this, when we hear crossing the Kidron Valley, we can think, oh my word, a valley like between mountains. That's a long journey. No, it's a very short journey. And our timeline here, the, the supper from about six to nine, they leave about nine and go across about 10. They're passing about 11 o'clock. If we follow the, the time frame here, Jesus begins his time of prayer in the garden. He's praying in the garden. It's about 11 p.m. on Thursday, roughly about 2 a.m. on Friday when he concludes. But let's read the passage together. I ask you to turn to Mark chapter 14 if you're following along. I believe it's in your handout as well. Beginning in verse 32, it says this. Then they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John, the inner circle, with him. And he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. And then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. Now, if you have an inner circle of friends, I'm not talking about acquaintances, inner circle of, I mean the people that you would call on in a life or death situation, and you call them and you say, I am deeply distressed. I need your help. Pray for me. Sit here. It just, just, just encourage me hold my arms up during this time you'd think they might do that listen to this story he went a little farther and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible the hour might pass from him and he said Abba Father all things are possible for you take this cup away from me nevertheless not what I will but what you will Then he came and found them sleeping. These guys that you would think, the inner circle, his closest friends, my soul is distressed, pray for me. He comes back. They're sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away. And he prayed, and he spoke the same words, and when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. Then he came the third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. Don't miss the phrase. We talked about it last week. The hour is come. Remember the other passages we covered last week? My hour has not come. My hour is not yet. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Now let me give you the picture here for just a moment. Jesus has left his disciples and he goes away and he prays for three hours. Again, about 11 p.m. on Thursday to 2 a.m. on Friday. During this third hour, read, read the accounts of the sweat that's just pouring out of him like blood. People say, oh, that can't happen. The medical professionals have said, oh, yes, it can. There's a name assigned to it. Yes, when we're under such duress and stress, literally blood will come from our pores. And Jesus, experiencing this, deeply distressed, begins to pray. 
the rock upon which he prayed. If you go to, into uh, Israel today, you'll see it there. And they built, in every, every site in, in uh, the Holy Land, when something special happened there, they built a church around it. Well, in this case, it's the church of all nations, and it's built around this, this rock. Luke 22, verse 43, it says this. It tells us that it was in Gethsemane, and it was in this moment that the angel came to strengthen Jesus. And I think we have a, a picture there of the garden. Have we got a picture of the garden up there, too? Can you go back one? There you go. Take just a moment and picture this. This is similar. Some of these trees, they estimate, could be 2,000 years old. These old olive trees, they're gnarly. They're not pretty trees. Um, they're not great shade trees, but they are trees that are very important to that land and for the production of the olive oil. And, and here Jesus, just get a picture of him walking through this garden. Now we see the walkways that are there, and they've, they've tried to make it a little prettier, but I want you to just get a picture of him walking through this garden. And stop for a moment. We read the story so quickly. In just a minute, we're going to get to the point to where the soldiers come. But I want you to get a picture of the area that they were in. And, and Jesus has left the disciples in an area like this, and he's wandered off just a little ways to this stone. And go on to the next picture. If you were to look in this, this church, they believe that that stone may have literally been the stone where Jesus had, had prayed. If not, it was in the general vicinity, but they built the church right around this particular stone. This could have been that stone where Jesus literally had prayed to the point that, is, that the blood had dripped. All of this taking place. He says, The hour has come. The Son of Man is being delivered and betrayed. into the, He's being betrayed. He's given to these, these sinners, placed in their hands. Let's go on with the story. Jesus arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane about 2 a.m. on Friday morning. Mark chapter 14, if you're following along, look at verse 42. He says to the disciples, his inner circle, rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Jesus knew this was happening. And immediately while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude of swords and clubs, uh, came from the chief priests and scribes and the elders. Now his betrayer had given them a signal saying, whoever I kiss... He's the one. Seize him and lead him away safely. As soon as he had come, immediately he went up to him and he said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Then they laid their hands on him and took him. And one of those who stood by drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. We know that to be Malchus. It was Peter that, that uh, made the attack. And then Jesus answered and said to them, Have you come out? as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? Pause there for a minute. Think about this. An army comes out with swords and clubs to take God. It's not going to happen. You do realize that, right? It, the seriousness of the statement is almost one of the humorous aspects of the statement. If you come out to take me with swords and clubs, you guys do realize that's not going to work, right? Let's go on. Verse 49, I was daily with you in the temple teaching and did not, and you did not seize me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. And then they all forsook him and fled. Judas identifies him with a kiss, a mark of love. Peter cuts off Malchus's ear. I didn't read that particular passage. Again, the harmony of the gospels, but the rest of the story is he replaced the ear. Now, you're out there with swords and clubs. God just said, do you really think you're going to take me with those? You see an ear laying on, a gra on the ground, and a guy's got his hand up over it and, and blood dripping down, and Jesus reaches down and picks up the ear and goes, no problem. And he just puts it back on. Don't you think the guys that were watching, I mean, don't you just think for a moment they might have gone, wow. There's something different about this guy. The story goes on. Jesus speaks. What happens to the army? They all fell down. Go back to that part. You come after me with clubs and spears? Seriously? Swords and spears? Seriously? One word. They all fall. He just picked up an ear and put it back on. He just spoke, 
and the whole army falls down. And you still think they captured him? I would have been one of those guys going, I'm not sure why I'm here, but I'm kind of siding with those guys right now. I think there's something different about him. But in all of that, we read in the scriptures, even all the way back to Pharaoh, about the hardness of their heart, that God allowed him to harden his heart. Remember with Pharaoh, when all the circumstances would have forced somebody to say, yes, I can't take it anymore, yes! God allowed him to harden his heart. And in this case, it's the same thing. You watch two miracles take place, and he hardened their hearts. See, salvation is available to all, but it's up to you to make that choice and that decision. And there are times people just harden their heart in spite of all the circumstances. I shared with you last week how that the uh, Passover Seder meal that the Jewish people observe every year is so absolutely spot on to showing them. You can't deny every aspect of it points to Jesus as the Messiah, but they've hardened their hearts. And in this case, the same thing happens. Jesus was not captured. He gave himself over. We move on. Between 2 a.m., about 9 a.m. on Friday, Jesus has tried seven different times. There are so many miscellaneous scriptures. I believe they're on your sheet. If they're not, I'd be happy to give them to you later if you want to study this out. But there are some religious trials, three religious trials. He goes first before Annas. Annas is the Jewish appointed high priest. The Romans didn't want to get involved in all of the, the religious stuff with the Jews. They wanted to take care of the political stuff. You take care of the religious stuff. They send him over to Annas. Annas says, uh-uh. Nope. Send him to Caiaphas. Caiaphas is the Roman appointed high priest. The Romans said, we don't want to mess with it. We're going to put you in charge. So here's the son-in-law of the father-in-law that said, I don't want to mess with this. He sends him over to the Sanhedrin. Then the civil trials begin. We don't have enough. We can't, we can't put him to death. We hate this man so much. We want to kill him. We don't have the power uh, or, or the right to exercise capital punishment. We want to find something political. Send him over to Pilate. They send him over to Pontius Pilate the first time. You find it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Pilate sends him to Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas sends him back over to Pilate for the second time. Then he goes from those three civil trials into a public trial. So there's three religious trials. There's three civil trials. There's one public trial. All of this in a matter of seven hours. It's a kangaroo court. All of this is just somebody trying to find something that will stick. Find something to where we can kill this guy. I can't do it. You find it. I can't find it either. You find it. I can't find it. Send him over here. Send him to this group. Somebody find something. We can't let him continue. He goes to the public trial. The same crowd that welcomed him in the week before is standing there. You can hear the murmuring. You can hear the screaming, the complaining. Pilate says, I don't find any fault in this man. They crucify him. Pilate looking for a way out. He says, okay, the custom is I can release a prisoner. Surely they're going to choose Jesus over this, this murderer. I said, it brings Barabbas on out. They said, no, free Barabbas. Free Barabbas. What do you want me to do with him? Release him. What do you want me to do with Jesus? Crucify him. Like, You've got to be kidding. Have people lost their minds? You would rather have a, a career criminal on the street? rather than a guy that just believes differently than you do? Kind of sounds like today's world, doesn't it? Pilate gives them what they want. He's a politician that basically gives in to the public pressure. And you know what you find in this? A lesson for the church. The majority is seldom right. Let me say that one more time, because this is one of the reasons that churches should never be democracies. People ebb and flow with their emotions, and rather than, than sticking with scriptures and sticking with facts and, and exercising good judgment, so oftentimes the world moves on emotion, and the people that, that escorted him in are the same people that want to take him out in a week. Pilate says, I don't understand this, but you've made your choice. 
Here he is, king of the Jews. Interesting he says that because what they didn't like was his religious stance claiming to be God, and Pilate calls him king, which is the only way Pilate could have really interjected in the matter. They accused him of trying to usurp the authority of the government. Now it's the sixth hour, that's sunrise, about 6 a.m. on Friday, according to John. It's the third time that Pilate's gone out to the people, according to the book of Luke. Pilate's completely unable to get these people to think righteously. Mark chapter 15, turn over there, let's just read it. Beginning of verse 15, so Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, he released Barabbas to them and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium and they called together the whole garrison. They clothed him with purple. They twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head and began to salute him. The mockery, hail king of the Jews. Then they struck him on the head with a reed and spat on him, bowing the knee. They worshipped him, and when they had mocked him, they took the purple off of him. They put on his uh, clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. They didn't just set a crown of thorns on his head. I should have brought the thorns to show you. I've got them in my office. When we were over in Israel, there's a bush that when it's on the bush and before the thorns are dried out, it's very flexible, and you can, you can turn it and wrap it. I brought just a small section when we came back. It's about this long. When they dry out, they say you can drive them with a hammer, but they don't break. I carried this thing, and I had a, like a duffel bag. I wrapped it in clothes and everything else, and I'm telling you, as I'm walking, I'm getting poked in the side, and it's like, what else do I have to do to keep this from poking me? It hurt. And that was just an occasional prick. And they had put it on his head and they had beat it in with rods. Not, the reeds, not just let's set it there. No, let's make sure it stays. And they send him out. All this, the emotional pressure. Imagine this, the, the fact that Jesus has prayed in the garden. He has prayed to the point of bleeding literally from his pores he walks out, he's betrayed by one that he has invested his life in for three years. As he walks out there, he performs these miracles, and yet the people turn against him. He surrenders himself following the will of the Father. They escort him from mock trial to mock trial, kangaroo court to kangaroo court, up before the people. The people make a foolish decision, and then... He goes through all of this, the scourging, the mockery, the spitting, the beating. And he goes to the point of the crucifixion. If you're following along, look on your sheet at point six, Jesus crucified. It's Simon of Cyrene in northeast Libya today. He's carrying Jesus' cross. Mark chapter 15, verse 21. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. And they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated the place of the skull. The crucifixion was, was barbaric. It was heinous. It was just a, uh, it was capital punishment in that day and age where they weren't worried about the prisoner's rights. It was barbaric. It was brutal. It was torture, flogging, beating, the racking, the mutilation, all of this. It was standard process along the roadway to have posts with with points on them and literally impale the person up through the rib cage and hang them so that those that were passing by would know the brutality of the romans don't you go against us we'll take you out the third hour 9 a.m the crucifixion starts mark chapter 25 verse 25 it says now it was the third hour and they crucified him I want you to think through this for just a minute. Jesus had already been scourged. He was stripped naked. I believe with all my heart, he was stripped naked. It wasn't one of these things to where, you know, we do the, the, the semi-modest Easter programs where you wrap somebody with a little, little thing to cover them up. No, he was publicly humiliated, stripped naked, tied to the post to be flogged. They have ideas to where it was the chain on top of a post or where they literally had taken his arms around a post, but he was completely his back uh, exposed to where when they were flogging him, they would hit him across the back, they would hit him across the buttocks, they would hit him across the legs. That was what Jesus endured. 
The crown of thorns, as I mentioned, pounded deep into his scalp. The robe, when they get there, that they had placed on him, the purple robe, ripped off. Ever rip a Band-Aid off a dried scab where the Band-Aid stuck to it? Imagine that robe, that cloth that's porous that has been stuck on his back that the blood has now dried through the fabric as he's carrying this cross. It's been pressed in deep and they get there and they just rip it off of him. It's not a small Band-Aid. This is a full robe. They throw him to the ground. I don't think they said... Can, can you please sit down? I like they kicked his feet out from under him and just slammed him. Onto a wooden cross. Rough. Hadn't been sanded. Wasn't shellacked. They began to drive those nails through his hands and his feet. Ever step on a nail? I have. Ever step on a nail to the point you have to literally reach down and pull the piece of wood out of your tennis shoe? I have. It hurt so bad I didn't want to look till I finished doing what I had to do because I knew I'd be not want to do anything else. Jesus, as he watches those nails driven through his hands, not a 16-penny nail, a stake, a spike, driven through the, the point to where it wouldn't pull through, through the bone and cartilage. They drop the cross into the ground. We paint this picture of Calvary even like it's, it's some beautiful picture. It's like, are you serious? Think of this. He's been laid out, filleted, nails driven into him. And whether you believe it was just the crossbar or whether you believe it was the whole cross, either way, dropped to where the pressure pulling on those nails. Each breath he would have to push up. This was torture. It wasn't something fun to watch. The humiliation, the mockery, the spectacle, and the sign, King of the Jews. Now, the sixth hour, 12 noon on Friday. Mark chapter 25, verse 33. Now, when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. The ninth hour is 3 p.m., darkness over the whole land. I don't think it was just a, a little bit of darkness. I think it was dark three-hour period. So they saw an ear replaced. They saw an army that falls. They see the sun go dark in the middle of the day. And you keep doing what you're doing? That's a hard heart. Jesus' last words in Hebrew and Aramaic, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken? Why have you abandoned me? In my mind, probably the hardest part of the crucifixion was that point right there. Where Jesus Christ, the Son of God, cries out to the Father and says, Why have you abandoned me? Have you thought about that? Worse than the, the uh, spikes in the head, worse than the beating on his back, worse than the spitting and the, the plucking of his beard, worse than all the things you could put together. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Probably the darkest moment in the crucifixion process. Mark chapter 15, verse 37, Jesus cries out with a loud voice and he breathes his last. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus died before sunset. There on the Passover, this, his bones were not broken. It fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. The spear driven into his side to make sure that he was dead from his side flowed the blood and water. Again, medical professionals would say that there is such a phenomenon when you die of a broken heart. When you look at all of this, they remove Christ and they put him in a borrowed tomb. Oh, but that tomb isn't the end of the story. And that tomb is where we're going to pick up next week. But for today, I want to ask you, hearing what we just heard, reading the account of Mark, realizing that Jesus did all of this in great duress, asking, Father, is there some other way? If there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. And God said, there is no other way. 
you are the way. You're the truth. You're the life. No man can come unto the Father except through you, Jesus. There's no other way. The creator of the universe allowed himself to be taken by those he had created. Knowing that before he ever created them, this day would come. Why? Because he loves you. Because he loves us. He did all of this. He created that cross. He created those guards. He created mankind, those who would turn their backs. He created those who would inflict the torture upon. He created them. Because he loved us so much. And he knew that was the only way. On that cross, he paid the sin debt for all of mankind. For God so loved the world that he gave, gave over his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. My question to you today in hearing what Jesus endured is, what will you do with Jesus? The hardness of the heart that caused people that saw the miracles of the ear, the miracles of the people falling over, the the miracles of the sun going dark caused them to continue down the same path that they started that morning. My question to you is, is your heart so hard that you're going to continue choosing against Jesus? Or today is your heart being softened to where you say, today's the day. I want to choose Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And that decision is yours. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment? Today, the invitation is so simple. If your heart is hardened, pray for God's mercy. And realize that the day is coming when you will not see heaven. But you'll spend eternity in a place called hell where it speaks of the fire not being quenched, the worm dies not, there's weeping, there's gnashing of teeth for all of eternity. The Bible still speaks of it. For those this morning, though, that realize that what Jesus did was the only way of salvation and it is available to you, I invite you today, would you say just thank you Jesus for what you endured for me. Today, would you call out to him and confess your sin? God, I am sorry for the things I've done, the way I've been living, the choices that I've made that are against you. And God, today, I ask you to forgive me. Now I understand why the blood of Christ flowed down his arms from his head all the way to his toes why he was beaten as Isaiah said beyond even recognition you did it for me so God the best way that I know how this morning I'm inviting Jesus to be my savior my lord and God I close the service this morning at this point with a simple prayer saying, help each one of us this week to be reminded of the sufferings of Christ, where our Christianity becomes cultural or even calloused, where we just go through the, the motions and it's not real. God, rebuke us this week. Cause us to stop and to realize what Christ did for us. And while our Christianity may grow old to us or we may become callous toward it or we may just become a a little casual Lord remind us this week that, that Jesus didn't go through a casual experience he was fully committed and that's what you want from us fully committed fully devoted followers the word disciple you don't want somebody that just claims a name you want somebody who walks the walk God, in that this week, I pray that you would challenge our church family to be fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.